Welcome to the Congregational Church of Austin, a church of the United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming church dedicated to ministries of justice in Austin and beyond, committed to the exploration of the myriad ways in which God has spoken and continues to speak to us individually and as a community. Today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, the high holy days of the Christian calendar. Today, we read the story of Jesus's celebrated entry into Jerusalem after the long journey down from the Galilee in the north. Let's rehearse the outline of the subsequent signal events of the next few days. After this Palm Sunday entry into Jerusalem, Jesus returns to Bethany on the other side of the Mount of Olives where he is staying with friends. The story continues telling us that Jesus went into the temple in Jerusalem every day to teach, commuting from Bethany. Then on Thursday evening, he gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem with his disciples for what is known as the Last Supper. We will commemorate and ponder that event on, our, on Monday, Thursday in our evening service. That service will end with a special liturgy of tenebrae, shadow in Greek, where we will recite the darkening story of the events of the evening. For after that meal, Jesus and the disciples retired to a wooded area outside the city walls. And Jesus anguished over what was to come. Then Judas betrayed him. He was arrested. Then he was tried by a council of elders and imprisoned and abused and finally crucified. We call that day Good Friday because Christians have understood the crucifixion, brutal as it was, as a redemptive sacrifice, comparable to the sacrifice of the Jewish Passover, which was going on at the same time. Jesus is understood as the Passover lamb. There are an infinite number of ways to understand this and some to misunderstand it. This week we'll contemplate what wisdom such an event might, to dis might disclose to us this year. The week culminates with Easter, the day of resurrection, when the tomb in which Jesus had been laid was found to be empty. This sequence of events is laden with mystery. It is both gory and glorious. It is commonly referred to as the passion of Christ from the Latin patior, meaning to suffer or endure. How meaningful might it be to contemplate the sufferings and endurance of this past year in the light of the phenomena of Holy Week? The passion allows for no simple explanation, but truly no intermixing of the divine and the mortal can ever be without mystery. Therefore, we enter into this week, into this week seeking whatever glimmers of insight or sparks of enlightenment may appear before us. Whatever we give to this week, it will return to us multiplied. Seeking such light, I invite you to light a candle with me, signaling that this hour is set apart from the rest of the week, from our work and play, in this hour, we enter church 
not as a building, but as a time hallowed by separation, a moment dedicated to the experience of the holy. This hour is a pause to explore the movements of the divine within and around us, and then to leave, commissioned to do and to be something new. Let us begin.
these scripture lessons for today are drawn from the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, the 50th chapter, and from the Gospel of Mark in the New Testament, the 11th chapter. Hear now from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning, he awakens my ear to listen as do the disciples. The Lord God has opened my ear and I, I did not rebel, nor did I fall away. My back I gave to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked my beard. My face I did not hide from insult or spit, but the Lord God has helped me. And so I have not been disgraced. And thus I have set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be shamed. My vindicator is close. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my accusers? Let them confront me. If the Lord God helps me, who can declare me guilty? Why, they shall wear out like a garment. The moth shall eat them away. Here endeth the lesson from the prophet Isaiah. And now we turn to the Gospel of Mark, the 11th chapter. When they were approaching Jerusalem, at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. So they went and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks upon it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Here endeth the scripture lesson for today. Thanks be to God. The story from the Gospel of Mark is a familiar one. We read it from one or another of the Gospels every Palm Sunday, every year. As in every story, there is much that is left out. I have been to Jerusalem many times. I have visited the village of Bethany on the backside, the east side of the Mount of Olives. Jesus would have risen, ridden that donkey up over the top of the Mount of Olives from there, he could see the city of Jerusalem laid out before him across the Kidron Valley. He would have ridden down the western slope of the Mount of Olives through the valley and up the other side into the city, probably entering into the Lion's Gate, now known as St. Stephen's Gate, or possibly the Golden Gate that leads directly into the temple compound. But what is left out of this story is that the road through the Kidron Valley leads past a graveyard. Some of the monumental tombs are still there. Now, the western slope of the Mount of Olives is covered with a massive Jewish graveyard. 
in the depths of the valley by the stream that runs from time to time are Christian graves. And there are Muslim tombs up on the east side under the wall of the Temple Mount. This is a favored place to be buried because in all three traditions, the Messiah is expected to return on the Mount of Olives and resurrect the dead. And everybody wants to be first in line. Likewise, Jesus would have skirted the Garden of Gethsemane in the Kidron Valley where a few days later he would go apart from his disciples and pray to God in anguish over his fate, crying to God to take this cup from him, hoping that God would defer the cross. In a very real sense, Jesus passes from the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem through the valley of the shadow of death. It is the veil of uncertainty. Death is like that. Death is an uncertain certainty. We all know that we will die, but the time and the manner, what we most fear is uncertain, unknown. It will come, but no one knows the manner of its coming. Jesus prays in Gethsemane in hopes that God might chart a different path forward. He ends saying, but not my will, but thine be done. But there is just a chance that God might will a different course. This, what I'm doing today, is not a meditation on death. It is rather a reflection on uncertainty. Of what are we certain? How do we cope with uncertainty or even acknowledge it? The spiritual life is rooted in uncertainty. The very essence of Holy Week is certain uncertainty. That might even describe the essence of the Christian faith. To clarify this unclarity, let us turn to the passage from Isaiah. Here, the prophet himself is reflecting on his role as a prophet. In much of this passage, he is girding himself for contentious situations. He gives his back to the smiters and his cheek to those who pull the beard. Who will contend with me, he asks. We will stand together. And finally, with a touch of arrogance, he smirks. All of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Prophets convey the word of God. There is no vagary in thus saith the Lord. They live in the spaces of conflict. They see the wrongs of the nation, the idolatry of the people, all the ways that this people that God has chosen that God loves has nevertheless strayed from the paths of righteousness. Prophets and those who see themselves in the prophetic tradition need to stand together. All those who are smitten needs to, need to stand together. It is the heart of the pastoral task to stand with those who suffer, and it is the heart of the prophetic task to stand with those who suffer wrongly. We've heard this story before. Jesus commands us to free the captives and to let the oppressed go free. Thus saith the Lord. But Jesus also reminds us of what is hidden from us. When Jesus comes down the Mount of Olives in Luke's version of the Palm Sunday story, he looks out over the Kidron Valley at the shining city of Jerusalem, and he weeps. He says, would that you knew even today the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from you. There is a little chapel, chapel marking the event, if not the spot. 
A few years ago, I looked out from the chapel balcony and I saw Jerusalem through a heart of barbed wire. How appropriate, how tragic, how heartbreaking. Would that you knew, even today, the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from you. They are hidden from us. The things that make for peace. This adds a question mark. What is hidden from us? What do we not know? In his famous chapter on love, in his first letter to the church in Corinth, Paul ends by saying, we see in a mirror dimly. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. Isaiah strikes a similar note. In our passage, this break from prophetic pronouncement to personal reflection, he begins by saying, the Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, a, a skilled tongue. Isaiah is a teacher. This is a, a role, though, that is separate from the prophetic role that conveys the words of God. These are his own words his own reflection on the implications of the divine word. When God says at the beginning of this chapter, which we did not read, for your crimes you have been sold, and for your offenses your mother was sent away. We then ask, what crimes are these? Who committed them? Is everyone implicated? Why do the innocent suffer along with the guilty? The prophetic word is only the beginning of discernment. Then comes the word of understanding, the time of application. And so God, so Isaiah teaches. But then Isaiah goes on to say, morning after morning, God awakens my ear to listen, as do the disciples. He must listen, listen as a disciple. Immediately after identifying himself as a teacher, he identifies himself as a student. The knowledge of the teacher is qualified, counterbalanced by the unknowledge of the student. And he accepts this unknowing, for he goes on to say, The Lord God has opened my ear, for I, I did not rebel, nor did I fall away. There is a peculiarity of Jewish interpretation that Christians would be wise to emulate, that every jot and tittle of the Bible is independently meaningful. So when the text says, I, I did not rebel, this apparent redundancy has a purpose, has meaning. Perhaps it is I, even I did not rebel. Another interpretation for why should there be only one might be that I, the prophet, and I, the student, did not rebel, the esteemed and the lowly. Another might be that I did not rebel against listening to God, and I also did not rebel against learning from my students, for it is a poor teacher indeed who does not learn from students. Even Isaiah, whom we regard in the Bible as authoritative, has his learning moments. He's the most important prophet in Christian theology. For instance, Handel's Messiah quotes Isaiah 21 times more than any other book of the Bible. Psalms comes in second at 15. But for all his authority, Isaiah has much to learn. What this raises for us is the question of uncertainty. In the mystical path of Christianity, unknowing is the way to God. St. John of the Cross, a 16th century Spanish monastic, wrote in a famous book, a classic, 
of the dark night of the soul, those times of perplexity and disorientation, which are essential for the approach to the divine. Another classic of the spiritual path is the sixth century Cloud of Unknowing, written by Dionysus of the Areopagite, supposedly. Unknowing makes space for the apprehension of God. It moves aside our pretensions of knowledge to allow for the entrance of the holy, the real, the true. If unknowing is essential to the spiritual path, it is uncertainty that is essential to the prophetic path. But is that true? The prophetic path is really all about knowing, isn't it? Like Isaiah, we stand boldly in the face of the smiters and the beard pullers. We stand together in the certainty of God's call to justice. We know about structural racism in our society and in our history. There is no doubt about that. The prophetic word requires clarity, but clarity is not the same thing as certainty. We are clear that black men, women, and children are targeted by police and politicians, by the publics in the street and the people at work. We know that Asians are similarly at risk and women and the disabled and Native Americans and so many others. We know, but how should we understand how and why this happens, when and where? what to do and how, that is not so clear. We cannot be certain, for instance, about the motives of the shooter in Atlanta. Motives are not simple. We cannot claim certainty about why so many people voted for Trump in the last elections, even though I've heard many people say exactly why that is true. But people are not simple. We do not know the ways of our complicity in the racism, sexism, classism, and other fractures of our culture. We see in a mirror dimly. I am struck from time to time how frequently I, well, and everyone else, speaks with certainty about what is actually quite uncertain making sweeping, all-inclusive statements that any reflection would qualify as overreaching, pronouncing as fact what is merely possible or probable. Woe to those who declarations will suffer the cross-examination of politifact. Of course, persistent questioning, doubting, and challenging is a good way to get yourself uninvited from any party or conversation. But we should keep in mind the Kidron moment. Morning and evening, Jesus the teacher passes through the shadow of the Kidron Valley where graves remind him of the certain uncertainty of death. He passes the garden of Gethsemane, his place of anguish where he hopes that his death will be uncertain and can be changed. Isaiah too has his Kidron moments as morning by morning his ear is opened like a student. He too ventures into unknowing. Likewise, we must pass through the Kidron Valley ourselves to be reminded of our uncertainties that what we appear to know floats on a sea of estimation among the flotsam of fact fiction and fallibility. Uncertainty is not ignorance though. It is not merely humility even. It is rather wisdom. There's a Lebanese proverb on my office door that reads, then al wala yakin al better the speculation of the wise than the certainty 
of the ignorant. The prophetic path requires boldness for an injustice must not stand. But morning and evening, we must open an ear, not just to God, not just to each other, but to our inner uncertainties, to unknowing. Now I know that I will continue to speak with careless confidence, and so will others. But morning by morning, I will attempt to enter the Kidron Vale, the space of uncertainty, and remind myself of all that I do not know. That is wisdom. Of that, I am certain. A key Christian virtue is that of generosity. Generosity of the eye, noticing. Generosity of the ear, listening. Generosity of the mouth, speaking kindly. And generosity of the hand, giving. They are all of one nature, eye, ear, mouth, and hand. Summed up, these are all disciplines of the heart. Stewardship is generosity in all of its forms. It makes us mindful of our world, all that is around us and all that sustains us, the who and the what, the where and the when. Being mindful, we then assume responsibility and hold ourselves accountable to each other, to those beyond our knowing, 
to the world and to our God. This moment is one of many occasions to practice generosity, to sustain the church and all of its ministries, to offer ourselves by whatever means we can. Bountiful God, how can we ever thank you for all we have been given, especially our lives? We ask you to bless these gifts and our lives to your service. We do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, coming to the end of this service, I would like to offer a benediction from the Franciscan tradition. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain to joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. God bless you and go forth to do good, to love peace, and to bring joy. Amen. Amen. There's a song in every silence 